We're going to start out in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. I know God wants to do something wonderful today because, uh, you know, you can tell when the enemy fights. And I'm not blaming everything. I'm not giving the enemy any credit for anything he didn't do. But, but uh, there have been a few things this morning that have indicated um, he doesn't like me. <laughs> and he doesn't, he doesn't want us to succeed. But I don't care what the devil doesn't like. Because he doesn't have a vote. Neither does the world. Neither does my body or your body. Neither does the PA system. Because we're going to press on and, and press through regardless. And, uh, you know, I think it might have something to do with what I'm going to be talking about this morning. And uh, here in Matthew chapter 8, uh, one of the things that happened this morning is I uh, sent my notes to the printer and printed them out and then forgot to go pick them up and bring them with me. So I don't even have my notes this morning. But I know where I was going. And I have, do have a memory, so we'll see how this works. But usually I have my, my scriptures all typed out, and I just read them. Now I'm going to have to look them up to read them. So, amen. Uh, Matthew 8, 16 says, When the evening had come, they brought to him, talking about Jesus, when the evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Jesus cast out demons with his word. Yes. Now, I don't know what you're picturing here. Uh, in your mind, you know, words paint pictures in our mind, and I don't know what picture you're getting, but I, I am not picturing Jesus quoting scriptures over demons. We know that the scripture is the word of God, but I don't see Jesus quoting scriptures over demons. I don't see Jesus sprinkling water or oil or incense over them. What I picture in my mind is Jesus looking right at them and saying, get out. And they got out. He cast them out with his spoken, direct word. His words. And, uh, uh, and it was an, a powerful manifestation of his authority. Even to the point that he healed all who were sick. He healed every one of them. Well, if you stay in the context of this, uh, what picture comes to your mind when he's healing the sick? Is he quoting scripture over them? Is he praying to God the Father on their behalf? Is he sprinkling oil on them? What, what picture comes to your mind? If, he, if he's casting the demons out with his word, how, how would you picture him healing the sick on this occasion? With his spoken word. Because he treated demons and sicknesses alike. He made no difference between casting out demons and healing the sick. When he sent all of his, uh, you know, his 12 apostles out, he told, them, he told them, go and heal the sick, cast out devils, Raise the dead, freely you've received, freely give. He, he, he put them on the same equal basis. They're all subject to his word, to his spoken word. Amen? Now, we know there were other occasions where he laid hands on the sick and uh, where he did creative miracles. But we all, but in, this, in the context of these verses, it's, it's illustrating the power of his spoken word. One word from Jesus can change everything. Amen. 
There are many occasions of this. I'm, I'm not going to read all the instances in scriptures where Jesus did this, but it's, it, it, it's, it's all throughout his earthly ministry. The power of his words. Look in the Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 and verse 32. We'll start with verse 31 since uh, give us some background here. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Do you see that? Yes, sir. They were astonished at his teaching because his word was with authority. They picked up that there was something different and powerful about the words that were coming out of Jesus' mouth. Now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. We were singing about that this morning. How he's the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Jesus became famous for the power of the words that he spoke. Jesus spoke with authority and power and things happened. Amen. Now look in, in uh, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Verse 35. These are just examples of Jesus using his mouth to do great things. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. What did Jesus say? He said, let's cross over to the other side. Sounds like nothing. But do you know it was, it was a faith declaration? Because when they got out into the Sea of Galilee, a storm came up. They said, no, you're not going to the other side. Jesus had lain down in the boat to take a nap because he was very confident that he was going to go to the other side. You know what was on the other side, by the way? The Gadarene demoniac. See, when the devil knows he's in trouble, he puts up a fuss. And that storm was a fuss. And, and it was, it was, but it was contrary. It was against the word of Jesus. Say, ain't no way. Say, it. ain't no way. <laughs> ain't no way you're going to defeat the word of Jesus. So Jesus wasn't worried about it. He'd already put his word out there. He'd already said it. Let us go to the other side. So he's taking a nap. Perfectly confident they're going to get to the other side. And the storm came up and water started filling the boat and they're bailing like crazy and the wind is blowing and the boat's about to, about to go under. And they, they're, they're afraid. These, these veteran fishermen were afraid. So they went to Jesus and shook him and said, Lord, don't you care that we perish? Wake up, Jesus. All right, and we're going we're gonna to read about it. On the same day, when evening was come, he said to them, let us come cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat. Oh, by the way, they left the multitude after feeding them miraculously. So this miracle is fresh on their minds. And uh, so they, they went out in the boat, and other little boats were also with him. 
And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, you do not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind. How, how, how did he do that? With his word. He said something. He rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. I think in the uh, original language he said, Shut up and put a muzzle on it. That's what he said. Shut up and put a muzzle on it. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Now listen to what he said. He said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You see, Jesus was, he was amazed at their fear and unbelief because they had already witnessed him do these outstanding miracles. And it, every one of them was, was in, in response to what he told them to do, what he said. And he says, let us go to the other side. And they had no faith in his word that if he said we're going to the other side, we're going to the other side. And so while he's taking a well-deserved nap, they should have, according to what Jesus is saying here, they should have rebuked the storm themselves. And so we see, we see a, a, an inkling here of where Jesus is going with this whole authority thing. We see that Jesus is operating in the authority of God the Father, and his words are powerful, but the expectation is that that's going to be passed on to his disciples. He's expecting his disciples to follow his example and be powerful in spoken word. Now, I've been talking about this for a month now. And uh, you think, well, pastor, he's, he's stuck. He's like a broken record. You know, just keep going back to that. Well, you know, I keep listening. I keep praying. And the Lord says, I want you to hit it again. I want you to hit it again. I want you to hit it again. And today is about examples. Because I've, I've, you know, in talking to people, I found out they believe in the principles, but they don't, they don't understand. They want examples. Well, I'm, I'm sharing with you some examples from the Word of God this morning, and I'm going to share some uh, real life, modern day examples. But understand that God's words are powerful, but the revelation that we need to come to is our words are powerful yes. as well. Our words are powerful. So they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? They didn't get the point. You know, it takes a born again spirit and, and, and someone that's attuned to the Holy Spirit to understand what Jesus is talking about. They did not, they did not connect the dots. They didn't, they didn't connect the dots between the feeding of the multitude and what was happening out there on that on that body of water. They didn't connect the dots between Jesus saying, you know, set them down in companies of 50 and 100 and, uh, and, uh, and we'll feed them with five loaves and seven loaves and two fishes, whichever it was. He said, you know, they didn't connect that to let us go to the other side. They had confidence in some of the words Jesus said, but in not all of his words. Are you getting what I'm saying? But then they for sure didn't even pick up on why are you so afraid? Where is your faith? They didn't get that either. They didn't get that he was saying you should have been able to do this. We looking back at it and looking at everything in its context, we understand exactly what Jesus was saying to them. We can read into it easily. Jesus meant that they should have rebuked the storm. They didn't even try. It never even came, it never even occurred to them 
Because they're not with it. They're not, they're not spiritually open to these truths that Jesus is laying out before them. And only after his resurrection and the baptism in the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts did these men begin to remember what Jesus said and put it together. And it's taken 2,000 years for the church to come back around to it. Somehow or another we lost these things. And we began to think in terms of we are lowly, unworthy, sinner worms, unworthy of anything, and nobody's going to pay any attention to us. We have no power. Only God has power. And God only chooses it to use His power on behalf of the super holy. I don't know where we got that idea, but we didn't get it from Him. Amen. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. He said, whosoever believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also. That's what Jesus said. Not what religion tells us. Religion tells us because if you're not ordained, and if you're not wearing your collar backwards, you have no power with God. That's what religion said. Religion says, oh, you, you need a miracle? You need, you need healing? Let's call the pastor. Jesus says, why can't you do it? <laughs> Where's your faith? Amen? You need to start having confidence in the words that are coming out of your mouth. Amen. We've been talking about that all month long. Okay, look in Mark chapter 11 now. Mark chapter 11. Y'all know where I'm going. You think? Verse 12. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Now, you might think Jesus... You know, Jesus had, he had wrongful expectations. It wasn't a season for figs. Why would he expect figs to be on that tree? Because he's the creator. Amen? Jesus operated in a whole different level of faith because he understood that the created has to obey the creator. And that tree was... His creation. So it didn't matter if it was in season. If Jesus wanted figs, that, that tree should have popped some figs out. Ripe ones. Y'all see that? So when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season. And Jesus answered, or in response, Jesus, King James says he answered, Jesus said to it. Now, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master, the head of the church, spoke to a tree. Yeah. Yeah. This Jesus we serve, this Jesus we're trying to get the world to accept, talks to trees. Yeah. First time I read this, I went out in the backyard and I started talking to the trees in the backyard. I didn't curse them, but I blessed them. We had a plum tree in our backyard and we had a peach tree. And I went out there and I started, I started telling those, 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 that plum tree, make good juicy plums. Peach tree, I want you to grow some big juicy peaches. Why would I have the audacity to do that? Because Jesus did it, and I follow Jesus. Amen. The Bible says, you know, that we're to imitate Him as dear children. We're to, we're to imitate God. So if I see Jesus doing it, in my mind, my simple West Texas, highly sophisticated mind, If I see Jesus doing it, that 
my mind says, I can do it. Because he said, if you believe on me, the works that I do shall you do also. Amen. You can't argue with the red letters. Amen. These are red letters. Well, Jesus answered the tree. Jesus spoke to the tree and he said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. It's one thing for you to go up there and mumble something. No man eat fruit from you hereafter forever. But he said it loud enough that his disciples heard it. He's putting a curse on that tree. And that tree's only sin was the creator walked up to it and you said no. You said, creator, master, you're going to have to wait like everybody else. <laughs> was Jesus mad? Was he angry? It doesn't say he was angry. It doesn't say he was mad. It just said he spoke to that tree. The tree said no to him and he said, well, if you're not going to feed me, you're not going to feed anybody. Bye. All right. You know what happened. We're going to read it here. Mark 11. Um, a lot of you know. You know what happened between the fig tree curse and uh, and then the next day, Jesus went into the temple and cleansed the temple. He had he had more on his mind than just a fig. This wasn't even this didn't even weigh enough on his mind for him to even look at that tree the next time they walked by it. Jesus. Jesus had more important things on his mind. This was a side thing. This was a teaching opportunity. All right? Jesus could care less about the fig. It wasn't about that. It was about being obedient to his word. Amen? And it was about how he's passing that authority on to his followers. All right, look at Mark chapter 11, verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, amazing. The fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Shazam. He, should, he shouldn't have been amazed. In one day, dried up from the roots. It was gone in a day. Actually, probably less than a day. Because they, they, were, they were coming back in the evening. No, it was morning. It was about a day. About a about 24-hour period. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, you think this fig tree is a big deal? I'm telling you, if you say to this mountain, and the mountain they were standing on is the same mountain that when Jesus returns back to earth, he's going to set foot on that mountain. It's going to split in half. A huge river is going to burst out of the guts of that mountain, and it's going to wash that mountain into the Mediterranean Sea. It's in prophecy. I didn't, I didn't take time to look it up, but, but I, I want you to know it's there. When Jesus said, you shall say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou, be, be thou plucked up, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. And not, not in your heart, but believe it's going to happen, you're going to have what you say. That mountain heard what Jesus was saying, and 2,000 plus years down the road, that mountain's going to split in two. A river's going to spring up right in the midst of it and wash it into the sea. That's good. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's largely because uh, you know Jesus said it. <laughs> Just a little side. That's good. That's good. Extra. Okay. <laughs> Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever, 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 whoever says that's word. Whoever uses his words to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, what things 
You ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And he went on to say, and you need to forgive. This is not going to work if you don't have forgiveness in your heart. Amen. But if, if, you, if you've got a pure heart and you don't have any unforgiveness in your heart, your words are powerful. Your words are as powerful enough to cast a mountain into the sea. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? That's wonderful. Well, I could go all through the Gospels and I could point out uh, many, many times where Jesus spoke with his words and then he told his disciples to speak with their words. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. There it is. Zechariah 14.4 His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed toward the north and half of it toward the south. All right. There's another scripture that talks about a river. But, hey, there it is. Well, Jesus knew that. He knew that, that, he knew that was in Zechariah. So he said, you know, that, that, this is how much power we have. We have the power to, you know, bust up mountains. And he said, so if you shall say to this mountain. Now, I believe the fig tree could be a... Uh, uh, Something figurative, something in your life that's not producing, something that's that's, that's hindering you, something that's saying no to you, mm -hmm. and uh, you have the you you have the power to curse it. I think the the mountain can refer to anything that stands in your way, any obstacle to you. Uh, you can you can tell it to move and get out of your way. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Th these are these are principles that we as Christians, spirit-filled Christians, ought to be operating on every day. You need to have confidence in your own spoken word, especially when you're doing the work of God. Amen? Well, back in uh, 1973, we had a guy in our community, a farmer, that by the name of John O'Keefe. He was 88 years old, and he was beloved, he was one of the pioneering farmers there in the Texas Panhandle. And I was pastoring in this little town called White Deer, 1,092 population. And he, his farm was just outside of White Deer. And every day we would, you know, every day I would go downtown to the coffee shop and I would drink coffee with the mayor, the bank president, all the businessmen. I mean, they all, they all gathered, you know, the, 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 Sheriff, you know, all the, all the people involved in the leadership in that city and that county, they would all come together nine o'clock in the morning at the coffee shop. And so I thought, man, this is a place for me to go and meet people and get to know people. So I'd go in there and drink coffee with them and uh, got to know all of them uh, pretty well. And they knew me. And uh, Papa John, he was one of those, you know, he'd drive in from his farm every morning in his pickup truck and drink coffee. Well, one day he wasn't there, and I inquired about it, and they said he's in the hospital. And it doesn't look like he's going to make it. And so I drove 40 miles to the hospital and, uh, and went up to ICU. He was in intensive care. And uh, they said, well, who are you? Are you a member of the family? And I said, no, I'm, I'm a pastor. I've come, to, I've come to pray for him. Oh, okay, so it was a Catholic hospital, so they believed in prayer. How about that? So I, I went in to the intensive care, and uh, there he lay in a coma in an oxygen, oxygen tent. And the nurse says, he's, he won't be able to hear you. Um, you know, she said, you're welcome to pray, but he's, he's out. He's, you know, he, he's not going to make it. You know, he's 88 years old. They already had that give up attitude. And uh, I said, well, I want to I pray for him anyway. And I want to I want to talk to him. And she said, "Well, there's this little this little uh, round circle thing, you know, with the air vent deflectors." He said, "You can talk to, you can talk to him through that, but he's not going to hear you." So I put my mouth to that thing and I said, "I said, Papa John, this is this is Ronnie Thomason. You know me. We drink coffee together." 
I said, I command you to live and not die. I command whatever is wrong with you to be rebuked. And I command you to be healed and get back up on your feet. And I do this in the name of Jesus. He didn't bat an eye. I mean, I saw no movement at all. But I, I said my piece, and I got out of there, and I drove back home. About a week later, about a week later, I'm in the coffee shop, and in walks Papa John O'Keefe. And everybody just looks up. I mean, people actually turn pale. They thought they were seeing a ghost. I mean, they'd already been talking about who's going who's gonna to get his farm and... I mean, you know, they're already breaking up his inheritance and stuff. You know. And they got, they got that boy in the grave. But he walks into that coffee shop. I'm sitting in the far back corner. He looks around. He sees me. He says, Preacher, as long as I live, you'll never buy another cup of coffee in this place. Fortunately, he didn't live long enough to make it really momentous. But at true, he was true to his word. Every time he and I were in there together, he bought my coffee. And he would buy my lunch if I let him. I mean, he was just, he, he, he knew I was there. And that word, that word got him not only out of that coma, but up on his feet. He drove his own pickup truck to the coffee shop that day. Hallelujah. Well, the next year, 1974, which was exactly 50 years ago, I was pastoring uh, the same church and uh, we had some teenagers that wanted to go to camp. They wanted to go to youth camp. And uh, so I agreed to take them down to youth camp, which was several miles away. And, but I didn't have, all I had at that time was a pickup truck. I had a 1967 F-150 red and white two-tone pickup truck. Well, it wouldn't haul six kids. And so, uh, I asked this guy in our church if I could borrow his car. Well, he was a car dealer, and he had this car that he had just got out of the shop. It had a brand spanking new paint job on it. And he said, I'll let you, I'll let you take that car. But he said, please don't scratch it. It's got a brand new paint job. He said, he said, I, you know, you, you're what? He even gave me his credit card to buy gas with it. He said, I, I bet, please don't scratch it. I said, okay, I'll take good care of it. So we went off and took these kids to camp. And we're on our way back after dropping the kids off at camp. We're on our way back and we're driving through a town called Plainview, Texas, the home of Jimmy Dean Sausage. And it's four o'clock in the afternoon and we come into town and there is not a soul anywhere. Four o'clock in the afternoon. There's not a car on the street. There's not a person, not a pedestrian. There is nobody anywhere. And I said to my wife, something's going on. So I turned the radio on, and there was this, this uh, weather report. A tornado has been spotted southwest of Plainview, Texas, headed straight for Plainview. Take cover. This is a recording. And then it repeated. Take cover. This is a recording. So I don't know how long that recording had been running, but everybody was gone. Everybody was in their freighty hoes, in their cellars, in their, in their basements. And we're out here driving down the street. And we looked to the southwest, and sure enough, there it was. Imagine the biggest, tallest, blackest funnel you ever saw in your life. And it, it stretched from this high clouds to the ground. And, you know, they tell you to put a post between you and it. And if it goes this way, you go that way. If it goes that way, you go that way. Well, I got that tornado. And I got a post between me and that tornado. And it was not going this way or that way. It was coming straight at me. So we pull into this Dairy Queen. The music's on. The lights are on. But the doors are locked. And we're sitting out there in this freshly painted car underneath an awning. And I'm looking out, and, and that tornado is coming right at us. So we decide we're going to run for it. So we, we, we change our course, and 
we head straight north as fast as we can. We get it out of town. It starts raining like crazy, and we could not see the highway. All we could see was tops of the fence posts on both sides of the ditches. It was so flooded. I said, well, we're not going to flood Bill's car out either. So we turned around, and we went back, got under that same awning at Dairy Queen. And that tornado's still coming. And I said, hey, will you agree with me in prayer? She said, yeah. Her eyes are big. You know. I said, turn to Matthew 18, verse 18. She turned there. If any two of you shall agree as touching anything you ask, Father, in my name, I'll do it. I said, I want you to put your finger on that verse of scripture, and I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to that tornado. And here's what I said. I said, tornado, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Creator God, I rebuke you. I command you to get back up into that cloud, and I command that cloud to go back where it came from. That tornado raised back up into that, into that cloud and it went back, it started backing up. I didn't know that that was unnatural. I, I didn't know, I didn't know clouds don't do that. But it actually went back where it came, it, it started backing up. So I saw this big opening in the sky and I says, Lord, if you'll let that opening in the sky hover over this car all the way back to White Deer, which was about 110 miles. I said, I'll appreciate it. And so we drove that car up the interstate, you know, all the way back home. That blue spot in the clouds stayed over our car all around us. We saw lightnings and thunderings and hail clouds and stormy weather, but that that opening in the clouds followed us all the way home. Not one drop of rain fell on that car, much less hailstones. And there there were tornadoes all night. We got home after night. We could see stars through that little patch of you know opening in the clouds. Well, the next morning I take his car back to him, and and Bill and I we go to the coffee shop and uh, Bill says tell these guys what happened and so I start telling them the story they start laughing they I mean they are mocking me they are they are ridiculing me they are laughing I mean like I had told some fairy tale kind of like what some of you might be thinking but there was a guy there who worked for the uh, the power company his name was Dusty Rhodes and everybody loved Dusty. He was one of those guys, you know, that everybody knew, everybody loved him. And he was like over the power grid for that area. And he said, well, I don't know anything about what he says happened there. But he said, I was in Plainview yesterday and I saw him there. I saw him sitting under the awning at Dairy Queen. You know, he worked for the power company, so he was out, you know, <laughs> you know, they go out in the storms to check the lines. And uh, he said, I saw it. And he said, that tornado did go back up in that cloud, and that whole cloud did go back to the southwest. He said, I saw that. I saw him there, and I saw that tornado do that. And all of a sudden, everybody just got real quiet. Next thing you know, they all had to go to work. <laughs> just clear the place out. People can't handle anything like that. They can't handle, they, they can barely handle Jesus having authority. But when you start talking about you walking in that same authority, people can't handle that. It's easier just to go with the grain and believe that nobody, nobody, nobody's authorized to do things like that. Well, I was 20, I was 22 years old when that happened. And God just unleashed, you know, uh, I want to say a monster, but I wasn't a monster. But it, boy, something got out of the box when that, after that happened. Because, well, I lived in Tornado Alley. And we rebuked tornadoes. 
We rebuked hail storms. We, re I, I mean, successfully rebuked storms. Because I learned that day that my words carry weight in nature. Amen? And I begin to associate with people who believe the same thing that I do. And uh, for example, my friend Ricky Fowle. He and I, you know, we, we, we grew up together. We were best friends. And we saw pretty eye to eye on the scriptures. And so uh, one day I'm still pastoring in White Deer, Texas. And he's holding a revival meeting up the road in a little town called Wheeler, Texas. And uh, uh, Amarillo is uh, Potter County. And then there's Custer County where all the where the farms began. And I was living in, in Gray County. And Ricky was holding a revival in Wheeler County. So it's Potter County, Custer County, Gray County, Wheeler County. And there's a road that goes right through all those counties. It's Highway 60. And the railroad tracks go right along that road. Many times the tornadoes would form all over those railroad tracks and follow those railroad tracks all the way up the line. One day I'm watching the weather and Dan True, the weatherman in Amarillo, said there's a hailstorm currently right now in Amarillo and, and uh, golf ball to baseball size hailstorms are falling on the city as we speak. And it did. It pounded people's roofs. It pounded their cars, broke out, broke out their windows. It was horrible. And he says that hailstorm is headed for Custer County. Well, Custer County is where my in-laws grew wheat, corn, and soybeans, and, and uh, you know, had farms. It, it was a farm community, and, it, and they were about to have the biggest bumper crop of wheat they'd ever had. It was almost ready to harvest. I mean, their wheat was white under harvest, and here comes this hailstorm to wipe them out. So I went out on my front porch, and I faced Carson County. And I faced that hail cloud, and it was green and yellow and, I mean, dark blue. It was, it was a monster storm. And I stood on my front porch, and I rebuked it. I said, you'll not hail one hailstorm on, on Carson County. That hailstorm came up to the county line, and... Across the county line, not one hailstone, not one drop of water, not even a gust of wind. And that hailstorm went clear over the county, about 50 miles wide, went clear over the county, got into my county, and I said, you're not gonna, you're not gonna hail on this county because this county is ranch land and there are cows all over the place and there's oil wells everywhere and you're not going to damage the economy of this county and I, I forbid you to hail on Gray County. But what I didn't know was my friend Ricky File was standing on the porch of the church in Wheeler. He's watching this same storm come up and he rebuked the storm and told it, you can't do anything in Wheeler County. So that storm that was pounding Amarillo went over three counties without dropping a hailstorm. Then it got into Oklahoma and wreaked havoc. Tornadoes, hailstorms, lightning fires. I mean, it tore up Jack. Because I guess there was no one in Oklahoma rebuking it. Well, I'm just 23 years, 22, 23 years old. I'm beginning to feel my oats. <laughs> and I began to try it on other things. Well, in 1991, I take a group of people on a missions trip to Saltillo, Mexico, a mountain town up in northern Mexico, and we're holding revival meetings. And uh, I'm driving, I'm driving to a church, Assembly of God Church, in downtown Saltillo, to preach. And and uh, I'm driving a Lincoln Continental Town Car that was loaned to me because we had we didn't have enough cars to haul everybody, so we had to borrow a car. And uh, 
took my van, took this Lincoln, and I'm trying, trying to take good care of this Lincoln because it's not mine and it's very nice, very nice. So I let, I let other people take the van and I, I took the Lincoln because, hey, we're just going downtown, what could happen? <laughs> well, a rain shower had come over and got the road slick. I didn't know it. And I ran that Lincoln town car right up under a city bus. Totaled it. I mean, just totaled. Didn't do any damage to the bus, but just totaled that car. Ran it right up under. It shaved the engine uh, and the whole engine compartment all the way back back to the windshield. And fortunately, they were built to where the engine would go underneath the car. But I mean, it just shaved it completely off the frame. So we're we're stopped, and my interpreter, a guy named David Pompa. David started screaming, my back, my back, my back. And I turned around and Aaron was sitting in the back seat and he had blood running down his forehead. And uh, I said, in the name of Jesus, we're not hurt. We're not injured. We're not, your back is, is fine and your head is fine. Well, David Pompa, he, he was, I mean, he was screaming, grabbing his back, and he instantly, hey, it's gone. And I get Aaron out of the car and I, I wipe the blood off of his face, and, and I, can't, I couldn't find out where the blood came from. He didn't even, he didn't even bruise. But we were, we were completely well. I'll never forget. And, and I didn't do that, I didn't think about it. Just when, they, when, when he said, oh, my back, my back, I said, you're not hurt in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I needed David because the cops were coming and I needed somebody to talk to him. I didn't need him freaking out and being in pain. So you know, I said, no, you, you, can't, you can't be hurt. God touched him. Instantly he was healed. I mean, that, that was 1991. I could, go, I could go year by year by year by year and tell you many, many stories. But how about, how about a couple modern stories, current ones? Um, Don Cameron, our missionary in Kenya, was uh, going from one meeting to another, and he had one of his guys driving. Don doesn't drive in Kenya. He has one of his Kenyan guys drive. So they're, they're driving to this meeting and a policeman pulls them over. The policeman comes up to the window and looks at Don and he says, I want to take you to jail. Don looked back at him and says, you're not taking me to jail today. And the guy says, oh, okay, you go on. Seems like a little thing, right? Seems like a little thing. But you know, you don't talk to cops that way, normally. But Don carries authority, and when he said, no, you're not going to arrest me today, the cop changed his mind. Didn't even ask for a bribe. Just sent them on their way. That's pretty cool, huh? Robert Fellows, just a couple weeks ago, had a test done, you know, and they said there's some there's something some kind of a growth on your on your liver, and uh, we want you to come in. You know, it's like on Friday they they wanted him to come in Monday or Tuesday for a CAT scan, and was it? And uh, so you know what Robert did over the weekend? He started talking to his liver. He started speaking words of healing over his liver. He started saying things. He said things to me like, when I go and they run that test on me, it's not going to be there. Amen. You know, they ran that test on him and there, it was not there. Amen. There was Amen. nothing there. Amen. Nothing there. Because of the power of his words. Now, we, want, we give God all the glory and all the, all the credit and honor for, for all of these things. But we need, we need to understand God chooses to work through us and our spoken words to accomplish things in this in this world. And we could go on and on and on and on, and I'm sure you've got stories too. But I, I, want, I want you to just be uh, encouraged this morning 
to have faith in the power of your own words. There is a certain responsibility that comes with that. If you know death and life are in the power of the tongue and then you speak words of death, that, that's a sin. For him to know who knows to do good and he doesn't do it to him, that is sin. Amen? If you know to do good and you don't do it, that's sin. If you know that your words have the power of death and life, then you're not, you're not going to speak words of death. Amen? You're going to police your own mouth. And you're going to ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Because uh, the Bible says the tongue is untamable, but not with not with God. All, all, I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. I can, I can speak words of life, and begin to eradicate all my death speech. Amen. We live in a world that's focused on death. Everything around us is, is about death. Try to watch a TV show. Try, try to watch any kind of a mystery that doesn't involve murder. Yeah, try to watch any action show that doesn't involve people killing people. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's all about death. All of the doctor shows are about people dying. All the cop shows are about people dying. All the, all the uh, detective shows are about, about discovering, you know, some, it starts with a gruesome murder, and then the rest of the show is about who did it. Amen? We, we're obsessed with death. Our society is obsessed with death to the point that we're not moved by it anymore when people die. Used to, if somebody died, somebody famous died, people would show some respect and not speak evil of them. But now, you know, they, they don't even have you in the grave and people are talking bad about people. We don't respect death anymore. We talk about the million uh, or two million unborn babies that are murdered, butchered in their mother's body every year, and it's just a number to us anymore. We, we don't we don't cry for those babies. We don't think about it. We live in a we live in a death oriented society. So when someone comes along, and the words that are coming out of their mouth are words of life. Of course you're going to get opposition because you're going against the grain. But the words of life, your words, your authoritative Holy Ghost anointed words are more powerful than the words that are spoken against us. Amen? The Bible says no weapon formed against you will prosper. Nothing anybody says against you will prosper. But your words have authority. Amen? So we need to begin to speak authoritatively. And to most people, it might just be a subtle change. You know, he doesn't talk like he used to. Used to, he's all negative. Used to, he's whining about things. Used to, he's always talking about his problems. But I, I noticed there's something different about him. Today, today it, was all, it was all positive. It was all life. It was all, you know, healing and deliverance and blessing. Because God's given us a mouth to bless with. Amen. And he wants, he wants sweet waters coming out of your mouth, not bitter waters. So praise the Lord. I, I just felt led to share those stories. Some of you have heard those stories before. But those are ones when I look back, uh, those were mile markers in my development in faith because that was when God was teaching me how to use my words. And uh, and and. Uh, that's why they stick in my mind. And uh, praise God. David Pompa, by the way, is he's a grandpa, got gray hair. And back then, he was just a young whippersnapper like me. But whenever we talk, we talk about that day when God instantly and immediately touched his back. I mean, before, before the smoke cleared, and we got out of that wrecked car. He was a healed man. And he went to work negotiating with the cops. Got me out of that mess for about $200. He did, he did all the negotiating in Spanish. Aaron and I sat on the bumper of a police jeep. 
and prayed in tongues. And he came over and he said, how much money do you have? And I said, I've got $200 that I'm willing to part with. I had about $2,000 stuffed in my boot. But I wasn't going to tell them that. So the uh, the policemen, they they agreed to let me go with without even a warning um, for, I think, $35. And the bus company, they came out and they, they agreed to let me go, uh, uh, you know, if I'd pay them $60. And then the tow truck that towed my car back to the mission compound, they agreed for, you know, a certain amount of money. And uh, we gave them all Bibles. They all, they all wanted Bibles. We gave them all Bibles. And so we wound up back at the missionary compound, $200 lighter, but we had the wrecked car inside the locked gate. And when the missionary saw it, he said, that doesn't happen. He said, first thing that happens is both drivers go to jail. They impound the car and you never see it again. Yeah. And he said, my son had a fender bender a few weeks ago and it cost me $25,000 worth of bribes to keep him from going to jail. And he said, you got the car and it only cost you $200 to get out of the whole thing. They didn't even write up a police report. I had to get some kind of special form, you know, to submit to the insurance company. Oh, and the insurance company paid off more than the car, uh, than, than uh, what do you call it, than the guy paid for the car. Amen. Why? Think maybe some praying in tongues helped? Yes, sir. God's, God's grace and God's favor. Amen. God's grace and God's favor. And it's, it's amazing because all of us people that filled those two vehicles up went home all the way back to Nebraska in my van. Talk about crowded. But we were just talking about what God did. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, how many of you feel your tongue being loosened up a little bit? Isn't it interesting that the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit involves your tongue. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Harold Bredesen, you know, who, who kind of wrote the book on the baptism in the Holy Spirit for the uh, Charismaniacs, uh, he always said that your tongue, when you're born, your tongue is tied. Because Satan doesn't want you talking. And so when you're born, your tongue is tied. You can't you can't speak with authority and power. But he said, when the Holy Spirit comes into you, he snips the cords that tie your tongue. And he loosens your tongue and you're able to speak in languages of men and angels. You're able to speak in heaven's language and you're no longer cowed down and intimidated. You're free to speak boldly. I like, I like that explanation. So when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we begin to speak in other tongues. That symbolizes that God's loosened our tongue. For what purpose? So that we can speak with authority. So that we can praise Him, yes. And speak of His wondrous works, yes. But so we can also go do His wondrous works. He said, if you believe in me, the works that I do, you shall do also. And greater works than these shall He do because I go to the Father. The reason he said it that way is he goes to the Father. And what was his next move? He sent forth the Holy Spirit. Amen? We can do the works that Jesus did and greater because he gave us the Holy Spirit. That gives, that, that gives punch and power to the words that come out of our mouth. You can call it anointing, whatever you want to call it. Amen? So, did y'all enjoy that? Yes, sir. Okay, we're going to have communion this morning, being the first Sunday of the month. New month, we'll start off by remembering what the 